Hello, everyone. Good morning, good evening, or good afternoon from wherever you're joining us. And welcome to the Oxford Food and Farming Conference and to our first session, Healing Our Connection with Food in the Fake Food Era. We are very honored to have with us today uh, for this session, Dr. Vandana Shiva, founder of Navdanya and the Research Foundation for Science, Technology and Ecology, and Satish Kumar, Editor Emeritus of Resurgence and Ecologist and the co-founder of the Schumacher College. Separation and fake food. We are living in an era where our connection with food and with the communities that grow it is being increasingly lost. Um, we all agree that how we produce, distribute, and consume food is increasingly becoming the center of the multiple crises we face today. But at the same time, in response to the crisis that we face, we are seeing a steep rise of techno fixes, such as fake food alternatives, which claim to be real solutions. Um, these false solutions are, replaced, are, are aiming to replace animal products and other staple food products um, with highly processed lab-grown alternatives using techniques such as synthetic biology uh, to create new ingredients not found in nature or lab cultures or implanting new genes through artificial transgenesis and gene editing. Um, as many of us have pointed out in the past, including Navdanya International, many organizations, these false solutions um, do not really challenge the, the, the capitalist uh, industrial mindset, but in, instead um, are receiving a full showcasing during key uh, uh, international fora, such as the recent UN Food System Summit or the COP26, where this superficial outlook on food and agriculture um, became evident when in the international leaders in hand with corporations pitched their attempts to address our crisis through the promotion of these fake ultra processed food alternatives, GMOs and biofortification. So even though these alternatives are being advertised as eco-friendly, um, it's obvious that the promotion of these so-called solutions seems to have more to do with giving new life to the failing GMO agriculture and the junk food industry um, and the threat that they are receiving or have uh, or are feeling from the rising consciousness and awareness uh, everywhere that organic, local, fresh food is real food, which regenerates the planet and our health. So these false solutions do nothing to challenge the profit-driven capitalist food and farming industry, and in fact, create further disconnection and further crises. So today's discussion, we will, we will explore how these false solutions only further sever our connection to the web of life, since they directly depend on the very industrial agri-food system they claim to solve. These reductionist solutions, in fact, negate the essential symbiotic relationships between humans, plants, animals, and microorganisms, and in the same way, also deny its potential for maintaining and regenerating the web of life. We will explore how re-establishing our connection with eating as an ecological act is essential in defiance of these false solutions that shift political power away from farmers and local communities. And at the end of our discussion, we will take questions. So please drop your questions in the Q&A box for our panelists to answer. And if you have questions for a specific um, speaker, please do specify. Vandana Shiva and Satish Kumar were among the first to highlight how these issues are fundamentally linked to a worldview based on separation between humans and nature and denounce the, denounced how the root problems associated with industrial agriculture um, are at the, at the core of the crises we fail today. Both firm believers uh, and some of the first advocates of a biodiversity-based ecological paradigm um, that is essential uh, for healing our connection uh, with the planet um, uh, as the true solutions uh, to our global crises. So, and, and their work has celebrated this connection between food and life and shown that it is farmers and small growing communities around the world and not industrial food chains that supply us with real nutrient rich food. With that, let me begin the first question 
um, and, in, 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 and I invite Dr. Shiva to, to start the discussion. Um, Dr. Shiva, a large part of your, uh, you know, you've been denouncing false solutions uh, such as lab-grown meat for some time now. And, uh, and, and you have warned us about how the dangers linked to these recent innovations, how they do not represent any viable solution. Could you take us through, through, the, through how these false solutions represent a threat to traditional diets and indigenous food communities and cultures around the world and how they are centered in this dominant paradigm or worldview uh, that sees a separation between humanity and nature? Thank you very much. And welcome Satish Ji and Vandana Ji. Thank you, Ruchi. And it's a pleasure to join the Oxford Real Farming Conference because real food comes from real farming. Food is our relationship with the living earth. And living earth gives us life. Every system of healthcare, whether it be Ayurveda, the science of life, which says, Annam Sarva Oshadhi, food is your best medicine. Or Hippocrates saying, let food be thy medicine. This deep connection between food and health only comes when the food is healthy. And what's the healthy food? Grown with care, grown with love, grown with a deep consciousness that food is really the, uh, the embodiment of the entire flow of nutrition through the web of life. That's what I've learned after all these years. Agriculture was not my field. Quantum theory was, and I remember so fondly, the first course Satish Kumar invited me to offer at Schumacher College was a course I was going to offer on quantum theory with David Bohm, one of our amazing teachers. But he fell ill during the course. And so I stayed the five weeks. But quantum theory, and David Bohm in particular, talks about enfoldment. Yeah? That inner quanta is the enfoldment of the potential for a system to evolve. That's what food is. It's the enfoldment of the sunshine and the soil and the seed and generations of breeding. It's the work of the butterfly and the earthworm. But it doesn't stop there because food is not stuff. Food is not a thing. Food is not a full stop. Food continues to the web of life in us and through us back to the soil. That's why we talk of the law of return. But we are walking food, you know, food makes us. And we are a hundred trillion microbes in our gut. We are only 10% human cells. The rest is the biodiversity within us. And that biodiversity within us needs nourishment of diversity. The minute you try and substitute toxics with the real flow of nourishment and food, you're going to get disease. And what we have learned over for our part of the world since the 60s and for the rest of the world from the 40s is there was first an attempt to substitute with artificial fertilizers the real fertility of the soil, which is the flow of nutrition from the sun capturing uh, the sun uh, um, and the carbon dioxide being captured by the green leaf photosynthesis, turning it into our food. And the more you have photosynthesis, that means the more biodiversity you have, the more you food you produce. That's why it's a scientific fact that the smaller the farm, the more biodiverse the farm, the more intense in care the farm is, it produces more food. That's why 80% of the food we eat comes from small farmers. That's the real farming. That's the real farmers, and that's where real food comes from. But because Hitler and his IG farm and labs had worked out how to fix atmospheric nitrogen by burning fossil fuels at very high temperature, they could start making explosives. And then the same harbor brush process started to make synthetic fertilizers. And the slogans of that time were, we will make bread from air. We don't need the earth. We don't need the soil. So every time of an artificial intervention has been an arrogance, uh, anthropocentric arrogance. We don't need the earth. And what has that done? It's given us nitrous oxide that is 300 times more damaging to the atmosphere than, climate, uh, than carbon dioxide. 
It's given us dead zones in the oceans. It's given us dead soils um, in, um, in our International Commission on the Future of Food. We did a study in the year of soil on the link between the refugees and the death of soils. That's where the refugee crisis is coming from. And one in seven people will be refugees if we don't start caring for the earth and start real farming. And then it came to the seed and they shot a toxic gene into the seed and said, we've made the seed. No, the seed makes itself shooting a gene is pollution. It is not the seed making, it's not creation. And that's why I joke and said, for the Monsanto's of the world, it's GMO means God move over. Why were they doing it? I was at the meeting where they laid out their plan. We need to patent the seed to make money by extracting royalties from farmers. That's where gene editing is coming from. That's where synthetic biology is coming from. That's where every instrument of the artificial is coming from. Extraction of rents and royalties. It is the old colonialism in deeper form. Now invading right into the life systems of every plant, every microbe. And now the fake food, 14 patents on an artificial burger made from GMO soya, they call it healthy. So, you know, when, when I started to work on the green revolution in India and wrote my book, The Violence of the Green Revolution in Punjab, I read literature, they said the soil is an empty container. It's the chemical that you put that creates fertility. They had no idea that the soil is a rich web of life. And the richer that web of life, through our care, through our giving back, the more the nutrition in the food. And our research at Navdanya has done it and we offer courses at Navdanya where we show how nutrition rich soils, organic soils can increase the nutrition in your crops. 50, 60, 70%. The more the photosynthesis, the more the nutrition, the more the soil organisms, the more the nutrition. So it is a web of life, food is a web of life. And you can't escape from that. So I saw that empty container idea like a continuation of the terra nullius idea of colonialism. Yeah, When Australia was colonized and, Latin, and America was colonized, they said, oh, empty land. There's nothing there. Those people are not people. They're just primitive flora and fauna. We are the only people and ours is the only civilized mission. But that separation and emptiness then continued with the seed where they said, the seed is empty, the life is empty, it's the gene we shoot in that creates the original seed. And what fake food is now doing is repeating the old failed narrative of we feed the world. They don't feed the world, it's the earth that feeds the world, it's the pollinators that feed the world. Our research has shown one third of the food we eat comes from the pollinators. So this arrogance, this hubris, is continuing with the fake food, but the same greed that led Monsanto to try and control seed and 60% of the world's seed are now in the hands of what I call the poison cartel. Those who worked for Hitler to make chemicals to kill people then continue to sell those chemicals as agrochemicals without which we couldn't feed the world. And that's what Rachel Carson wrote in her book, Silent Spring, everyone should read it. That's what Albert Howard wrote when he came to India and found the soils were fertile. And he wrote a book called The Agricultural Testament, which then allowed Eve Balfour to introduce organic in, in, in the UK uh, under the name of the Soil Association. All these links were so clear then, and they're clearer now, that health is a continuum from the soil to the plants to our body. Every break, every break in it, whether it's the break in soil fertility, synthetic fertilizers, a break in regeneration of seed, GMOs, non-renewable seed, patented seed, a break in the flow of food from the earth to our bodies is a creation of ecological catastrophes for the earth. Our work has shown 50% of the greenhouse gases come from industrial agriculture. And because the propaganda says, just like they said, we will make bread from air at the time of the fertilizers, they are now talking about making, uh, you know, basically having food without land. No, they're going to use more land because the lab food, whether it's using plants to make fake meat and fake milk or using animal cells, it's cellular meat and people are going crazy saying, oh, I won't touch an animal, but they're eating the cells of an animal 
artificially reproduced. All of this lab work requires two things. Number one, it requires huge amounts of feedstock. And Bayer is on record. They have said all this fake food, plant-based food is very good for our business because plant-based companies have to produce at scale and succeed. They require our row crop, our monocultures, and of course our chemicals to become sources of amino acids and carbohydrates. Food has disappeared. It's now become raw material for the factories, which is called lab food, but it is also hugely energy intensive. Every step where we don't work with the energy of the earth, her autopoietic energy is an external energy input and it will create more entropy. It will create more clarity. But the third is the real link. Every step of artificial fertilizers, synthetic fertilizers, every step of processing with artificial ingredients in ultra processed food has led to the exponential growth in chronic disease epidemics. We have a manifesto on food and health, which has all of this data. Now, if you're taking ultra processed food, which is already a known problem and turning it into ultra, ultra, ultra processed food, no one's talking about the health impact of this. They talk about climate change. They even want artificial breast milk, artificial lab made breast milk as a solution to climate change. What could be more intimate than a mother feeding her baby? What is the food miles? Yeah. No, they want to have millions of food miles with artificial lab made food, GMO soy and other ingredients. This is a recipe for total devastation of the planet's health and our health. And that's why we should just stay awake, stay intelligent, make our choices, grow our food. We've been doing this for decades in our generation. Humanity has done it for thousands of years. And uh, if, you know, uh, uh, my own work is always sort of, you know, removing these screens that are created. The false screens of creation. I created the seed. I created the food. The false hiding of the ecological impact. I call it the don't look, don't see. And then say everything's fine. They just don't look. So we are growing in scientific illiteracy, ecological illiteracy, health illiteracy. And meantime, we go around trumpeting, oh, science-based evidence. No, true science is the science of ecology. True practice is the practice of care for the earth. And that is food. Food is not a product. Food is a process and a relationship of love. Thank you so much, Dr. Shiva. Uh, I, may I invite Satish ji uh, to, to also uh, uh, describe to us a little bit about how uh, over the years, not notably through the Schumacher College, uh, you have strive to teach people about regenerative agriculture and living in harmony with nature. Can you explain to us what is the basis of such an ecocentric education? How does it contrast with this, with the current paradigm? And how do you think we can challenge this current order? Thank you, Ruchi. And thank you, Vardana, for this powerful, passionate, and broad ranging overview of food at this moment and what it can be in the future. Thank you. Uh, and I will come to ask a few questions and make comments as well. But first, let me also congratulate uh, Oxford Real Farmers Conference for organizing this event and giving us honor of being the first to start uh, this big conference and giving two Indians uh, this opportunity. And as you mentioned, Albert Howard went to India to discover the organic uh, compost making and organic material in organic uh, uh, soil. So there's a great connection between India and, and the UK and the world in this uh, question of food and farming and, and organic agriculture. And inspired by, to some extent, Albert Howard and also E.F. Schumacher, who was the president of the Soil Association. And I worked with him over many years and he was a great gardener, organic gardener, and a, and a planter of trees. And, and a, as a president of the Soil Association, he promoted organic uh, food production, real food production in his life. And so to honor his name, 
uh, and since he was my friend as well, uh, we established Schumacher College to bring organic agriculture as part of education. For me, Vandana, the problem at the moment is that all our dignity for farmers is disappearing. And people think that if you are educated, if you are smart, if you are intelligent, then you don't need to work on the land. You go and work in the office or uh, sit behind a computer or behind a desk, and then you are uh, highly paid. But if you work on the land, if you are a farm worker uh, and, and you um, plant the trees or, or plant the vegetables or anything to do with the soil, then you are not so smart, not so educated, not so advanced and, and, and therefore not so developed and therefore um, there's no dignity in, in our modern uh, industrial agriculture uh, for the farmers and for the workers. So what I thought is that farming and growing food and touching the soil and being out in nature and learning about the seeds and how the miracle of nature, the miracle of seeds and the magic of nature and the magic of seeds experiencing that in your life is the greatest education. And in my view, every school should have a garden. Every university should have be associated with a farm. And young people should respect and honor and, and recognize the value and the importance of touching the soil and growing food and then learning about science and mathematics and philosophy and, and theology and all other things are icy or the cake. But without food, all your theology and philosophy is nowhere. So Schumacher College, we started two things or three things. Number one, any student, even if you are coming for a short course, you must spend some time out in nature working in the soil on the soil, for the soil, with the soil. Then your learning will grow and you will be more ready to learn other intellectual things. So, so gardening is common to all students. But in addition to that, we also offer two further courses. One course lasts six months. It starts in April, 1st of April, and ends at the end of September. So this is season, growing season in the UK. And so during these six months, they, the students full time work and learn on the, with, on the, on, on hand, um, actual practical learning of gardening. Agro economy, agroecology, permaculture, um, biodynamic farming, um, all kinds of organic, natural, ecological growing. That's a six month course that we offer. And it has been going for the last 10 years. And it has been a wonderful success. And many, many young people in their 20s and early 30s, they come and spend six months and then go back. And, and I always tell them, don't look for a job. Create your own garden, create your own job and be the master of your own destiny. And so they create their gardens. They buy some land or they work on somebody's land and create the garden. So that's one very important practical program to implement and practice what you have spoken about the culture of food, which is so prevalent in the world uh, of, of fake food and artificial food. So in order to answer to that fake food and artificial food, we have created this course where we can teach young people to have a dignity and a respect and, and a pleasure in working on the land. The second course which we have launched is a one year long course. And that one year long course is on food, farming, agriculture, um, in ecological, so you can call it agroecology, food and farming with, on the principles of agroecology. So that is a one year program, it's a bit longer. So it's a more than gardening. It's also a little bit larger scale, which includes grains and includes trees and includes many other things. So six months course is more particularly gardening. Also we have trees as well, uh, fruit trees. Uh, last year, we grew 30,000 pounds worth of vegetables and we made 1,000 bottles of apple juice. So gardeners are also uh, in a broad way, but we want to make it a little bit even more broader 
uh, for one year long course. So even the winter time, you can be there at Schumacher College. So these are the two courses we are running. And, uh, and, and our mission in the end is, this is only an example. We want to see every school associated with a farm, every university associated with a farm or farm associated with the school or university. So that young people, not only students, but also teachers, professors, lecturers, they should also participate in growing food. Everyone who eats must participate even for one hour or two hours, <coughs> doesn't matter, symbolically even. Everybody must participate, even Prince Charles gardens. He's a prince, why not all of us garden? So everybody, even if you are prime minister, president, professor, lecturer, economist, scientist, whoever you are, everybody participating, even on a part-time basis in the gardening, that is our mission. So that's what we are doing. And if we can bring that dignity to farming and dignity to agriculture, that will be our main um, uh, mission. That is our main mission. And that is the Schumacher College work. But in addition to that, of course, we also run courses on, as you have taught there, Vandana, uh, on holistic science and, and holistic economics and, and, and ecological design and many other courses we also run. But, but for this conference, Oxford Real Farmers Conference, uh, I would like to focus on our two programs, one six months and one one year. These two programs are most um, relevant and pertinent for this conference. So, um, so with that, um, I would like to ask you, Vandana, that uh, you have been um, starting this Earth University. You have wonderful uh, 50 acre farm with 500 mango trees. And when I come to teach there, it is always a great joy and pleasure to be in the countryside just outside there are doing. So can you, like we, I have explained a little bit about Schumacher College vision as a kind of, we all now understand your uh, general critique of the, of the um, industrial agriculture and general critique of the fake food and fake farming and, and this lab food and all that. But at the Navdanya Earth University, how you are trying to present an example of the true food and true agriculture, which is ecological, sustainable, regenerative, fulfilling, and loving agriculture. If you can speak a little bit about your Earth University vision um, in a practical way, that will be very useful to many of our listeners in this conference, because many of them are already uh, committed to your values and my values and our values of uh, holistic food and uh, uh, degenerative food, but it'll be good for them to know some practical positive example like the Earth University and the Danya farm near Dehradun. Yeah. And of course, Satish, you are so hugely responsible for persuading me, gently bullying me to start a Schumacher-like institute at there are doing on our farm. Originally, we called it Beach Vidya Peet. We still call it Beach Vidya Peet for the Indian participants, which means the school of the seed, but it's a bit of a heavy word for others. So Earth University grew organically as the name of the university of learning from the earth, learning from the seed, learning from biodiversity, learning from peasants, learning from animals, learning from butterflies. Um, I mentioned 1984, I started to look at agriculture and looked at the Green Revolution. 1987, I realized that the chemical industry wanted to own the seed. And that's when I started to save seeds. And from 87 to about 94, I was saving seeds, encouraging farmers to save seeds. But then you would know, say four, 400 varieties of rice. And I would tell people, you know, there's so many varieties of rice. There used to be 200,000 rice varieties. We're having a beautiful exhibition in Delhi right now called yes. Krishi or Kala. Krishi is farming, kala is craft. You cannot do crafts without products. The grasses, the rice straws, all of that beautiful biological material that makes crafts, including the soil that throws the pot. All of it comes from agriculture. And so we had a beautiful ceremony where the craftspeople and the farmers honored each other and said, we will never give up our relationship. But we have on display about 500 varieties of rice, 
some that are salt tolerant, some that are drought resistant, some, of course, I don't know, hundreds that are aromatic like our basmati. So I saved for six years, eight, seven years, I just saved with farmers and I'd come back and say, oh, many of the varieties produce more and they'd say it can't be. I'd say there's so many varieties can't be because the propaganda of the Green Revolution was, it's a monoculture and the Green Revolution varieties produce more, industrial farming feeds the world. So I started the farm really as a seed saving farm to have it all there for people to see with their own eyes. Yeah. And I realized that part of what we've lost, not only the connection with farming, is the knowledge that comes from seeing and observation. True knowledge is observation. You, you know, we, we, had a we have a beautiful poet called Kabir, and um, the followers are telling him, you know, all these pundits and all these mullahs, they read the books and impress us. No, and don't impress us and don't inspire us. And you say a few words and we get inspired. And Kabir said something that we should all keep in mind in terms of education. He said, Wo kehte kagaj ki leki. they talk about what's written in a book. Yeah. I say what I see with my eyes. Yes. So the farm grew out of seeing with your eyes. Yeah. And out of that grew the Earth University. Satish is very responsible for it. I remember he was there saying, this is where the dorms will be. This is where the study will be. <laughs> and I literally had to build it in six months. Yeah. And, and the entire cost of building that ecological structure with the you know, mud balls and uh, mud and cow dung walls and everything local material, all the, all the artisans who built it are local. And we still maintain that relationship. All our work is done by local people. But the second thing that is very important for any ecological real farm is it, A, it cannot be a monoculture, but we are a biodiversity farm. So we have lots of biodiversity. We grow about 2000 varieties of crops, but we have more than a hundred kinds of trees. Some are fodder trees, some are fruit trees. There is no useless tree, just like there's no useless plant. The other day I stood on the farm and in a one square foot, we calculated 12, plants that are called weeds that would be killed by Roundup, of which five were edible and the rest were medicinal. So every time you're spraying Roundup, you're killing the healing biodiversity that give, nature gives us. We did a beautiful women's festival the other day. Remember everything your grandmothers ate from the forest, from the field plants, from the pastures. And we had a feast with wild foods. So very often the idea of rewilding in England is push the people off the land. But colonialism is what made people and nature separate. Rewilding is care for the land and the data is now coming out that where people are is the highest biodiversity. 20% of the indigenous lands has 80% of the surviving biodiversity. So I think we should get rid of the word rewilding as get rid of people. Rather say, let's rewild our farms and bring back the animals, bring back the trees, bring back the biodiversity. There is no weed. I notice many of you who join are either taking care of sheep or taking care of pasture. And there is an attack on animals right now. And very often in the name of protecting the animal. First of all, if you've written off the animals, how are you protecting them? If you've created a farming system, which has no place for animals, where will these cows and sheep go? You're writing an extermination verdict. And there's been a deliberate confusion created between factory farms, which we don't want, they should never have been there, and animals on farms as part of an integrated system of trees and animals and plants and soil. Yeah. People can so we have consciously kept animals. We don't have tractors because we are a fossil fuel free farm. Now, yes. if you don't have tractors, you've got to have a bullock. And yes. we have five generations of animals we love. They are part of our family. So bringing the animals back, bringing the trees back, bringing the wild plants back is the future of real farm. Yeah, Vandana, and that's what we do at Navdanya. Yeah, yeah Vandana, um, you are right. I, I totally agree with you. But the confusion comes when you have these millions and millions of animals artificially bred in factory farms and millions and millions of pigs and chickens and cows and so on. 
uh, and then you have to grow lots of soya, artificially <coughs> produced soya and other grain to feed the animals for the meat. So please tell us what is the balance between these two kinds of approaches. One is that we do need animals on the farms, of course, but the way industrial agriculture has developed and has created the millions and millions of uh, animals and they have to be fed by grain so that meat can be fed. How do you see the balance between the two? Well, I don't think we need a balance between something totally evil and violent and something that is necessary. I don't think there should ever have been factory farms. They're very recent. Okay. If industrial agriculture begins post-war to use up the war chemicals, it's the surpluses of corn and soya that create the intensive animal feed, which then creates the, is the surplus grains that created the feed industry, which created the factory farms. And if you do an analysis, the subsidies for feed are huge. That's why Europe had no factory farms 20 years ago, but today the European laws are forcing farmers out of having five cows whom they love as their family, to having a thousand cows, then getting into debt and having to leave. I remember, you know, Prince Charles and I talked, you know, he used to go to a, uh, one of the Eastern European countries and they had just passed Romania. their law. Romania. Romania, that if you have one or two cows, it's dangerous. So you must have a thousand cows in a factory. So I think cows should not be in a prison. Chicken should not be in a prison. We must release them. We don't need so many there, you know? We need, just like if you live with the right ecological balance, no agrarian society had a population explosion. Population started to explode when the enclosures took place, the highland clearances to put sheep on the land. That time the greed was for bull and the textile industry or in India, when the British grabbed our land and turned it into British property and started to create rents, which left to the famines. So instability comes from violence. Yeah. And that's why for you and me, ahimsa, non-violence is the guiding spirit. Yeah. No farmer will overpopulate their field with yeah. animals, yeah. but a factory farm will have huge numbers yeah. and they will work on subsidy, no factory farm works on a true economics. Yeah. Very often like chicken farms, yeah. the chicken is not owned by the factory, by the far farmer. He's just a worker throwing the feed out. And now they want, you know, they want everything automated. Just today, the new item in BBC, tra uh, driverless tractors. As if first you remove the farmers and, and say you only drive a tractor, you have no other knowledge, you don't have to do anything else. And now he's saying, no, get off the tractor seat also. We'll have self-driving tractors. No, we need to get rid of the tractors. We don't need heavy machinery. We need light machinery. And we need, I mean, I was in Punjab the other day, you know, this, Satish, we've had a 14 month protest by farmers against laws that would have totally destroyed the small farmers of this country. And they said, we want to be feeders. They call Annadapa, you know, those who give, we want to feed India. Mm. We don't want to be turned into unemployed labor for the big corporations. We want to, they said two words. We want to care for Dharti Ma, mm. yeah? Mother Earth. And we want to feed. We want to play our dignified role as Annadatta. They sat through the cold. They sat through the heat. They sat through the rain. They sat through violence. 700 of them died, but they didn't give up till the laws were withdrawn. Now that spirit, is the spirit of relationship. Yes, and yes. I think people forget that even though, far, you know, there's, there's careless farming, you know, get urea, throw it, get pesticides, spray it, put on a button and let the feed go, you know, put on a button and let the cows be mechanically milked. And there's another farming of care. And that farming of care produces more when you do the true account. Yeah, that's what I have found. So this illusion that, oh, increase of yield, productivity, more efficient, it's all fabricated out of fossil fuels and the industrial mindset. By looking at a part of a part of a part, 
rather than looking at the whole. So mm. at one level, we are at a very exciting moment of human evolution, mm. where all this knowledge is, is there for us through practice. Mm. All the people who've joined today at the Real Farming Conference are seeking ways to keep good food, good farming and real food, real farming alive. And then we have the sort where those who made this big money in Silicon Valley through deregulation now want to make big money by owning our food. Monsanto, the chemical industry, wanted to own the seed. Now the billionaires, the Gates and the Zuckerbergs, have joined hands with the big poison, big ag, big tech, mm. and they together want to steal our food. I won't say own the food, steal our food. Yes, yes. Because real food is what comes from the land. Yes, absolutely, absolutely right. Now the thing, you mentioned farmers in India, and they ran a very heroic struggle um, against this uh, imposition of monoculture and industrial farming. Um, do you think now in the Western countries, like in the UK as well, um, there is a big question mark how um, agriculture is being swamped by this industrial farming. Do you think there's room for farmers in the West or farmers anywhere in the world to resist like the Indian farmers did. And actually in the end, they won. <coughs> I have heard that government had withdrawn the legislation they were going to bring. That's a great uh, victory for the farmers. Uh, hopefully, I, I, hear, I want to hear more from you. But do you see a place for such nonviolent resistance on behalf of the farmers to stop this um, artificial food, um, genetic food, uh, industrial food, and all the kind of things which is going wrong so strongly, uh, like, like we have Extinction Rebellion against the, the climate change issues. We need farmers to stand up and join together, yeah. united to speak um, in, in, in favor of protecting the real food and real farming. Yeah. Um, you know, all of India's movements from the East India Company times have been peasant movements, Sadish. Yes. You know, 1857, we threw the East India Company out because they were extracting so much and using Indian people yeah. to shoot at Indian people. And so it was called the Sipoy Mutiny. You know, uh, the, I think there's the church in, uh, near Schumacher College in the town next door, Essex. So, yeah. you know, when you go by train, I remember I've been to that cathedral to give a talk and you know they talk about the Sepoy mutiny. It was a peasant movement yeah. saying yeah. we want to farm and they want to farm without exploitation. Uh, and then throughout our freedom movement, you know, then the Neil Satyagraha, Indigo was was had become a slave farming system, yeah. And then Gandhi did the first Satyagraha. 1942, because there wasn't enough rice for extracting it, the women started a Tebhaga movement, you know, leave two-thirds with us so we eat own two million of great Bengal famine in big. So every movement in India has been a movement to defend the farmer as the caretaker of the land, never in selfishness, never ever it's about me. And then in 91, you know, when the world started to change and globalization came and the World Bank with structural adjustment of India, that's when the three laws were actually first drafted, but they couldn't get through because there was very active democracy. That's when the draft of the World Trade Organization, GATT, came out, yeah, on patenting seed, destroying farmers through dumping and sanitary and phytosanitary measures. We'll tell you what's safe. The companies will tell you what's safe. You don't, you won't have to, you know, we'll forbid your cheese making, we'll forbid your small slaughterhouse, we will forbid everything small. So that package is what then helped us mobilize. And many of the people who are leading today are sons of the farmers who worked with me in the 90s. 500,000 farmers protest in, um, in Bangalore. And I remember Jose Bove was with, uh, no, Jose Lutzenberg was with me. And you knew Jose Lutzenberger, who I think was taught also at Schumacher. Yeah. And Jose looked at the sea of people. He said, now I understand, Vandana, why they want to get rid of the small farmer. Because the small farmer is the most independent producer. 
first, because all they have to do is with this beautiful body, work with the land. They don't need anything. They don't need metal. They don't need lithium. They don't need anything else. They just need themselves and the mother earth. And that is what a small farmer does. So in a way, the consciousness of the small farmer has always been regenerated in India. I think now because industrial agriculture has destroyed the population of farmers in industrialized countries, less than 2%, I think we have to organize around food, not just around farming. You know, very consciously our laws have kept more than 60% of our population in farming. And that's what the farmers were protesting for. They wanted to stay in farming. They want India to be a land of small farmers. And I'll describe a little bit about the organizing. It was very touching. But I think our movement of today has to be to support farming of the kind that supports the planet, not in fictitious ways, not in propaganda ways, but in true ecological processes and supports people's health. And this unity between farmers, gardens, producers is creative unity that we need to build. But the beauty of it is, of course, they were, but they weren't only farmers. Singers joined and made new music. That's why your passion for arts is so important. Artists joined. Women played a very big role. Young people played a very big role. They used to have classes every day. They didn't just sit there for 14 months. They read, they published. And singing spiritual music, as well as cooking together, they cooked for 14 months. And it was so touching that people from the city, there's so many poor people in the city, would come to this beautiful langar, you know, the Sikh tradition of sharing food as a spiritual gift. They would have these langars and the men would be cooking and the women would be cooking and someone would be rolling chapatis and someone would be making jalebis and it was like a festival. And then people would come from the town to eat for free. They were running clinics. The poor people would come for healing. So it became a music festival. It became a food festival. But there's a beautiful song a singer made. He says, when you go back, because once they'd won, they were going back. And that last day he makes a song. He says, when you go back, remember every moment. Remember the food you cooked for each other. Remember how you slept through the rain. Remember how the storm took your uh, tarpaulin away and you had to make your hut all over again. Remember how you had to live in one pair of pants for a whole year. <laughs> remember all of this. And remember, most importantly, what was the strength that saw you through? Yeah. And here's this lovely Sardar praying the Gurbani. Yeah. So I think, I think our movement now has to be food as an ecological act, eating as a spiritual act, joining hands with the earth, joining hands with the farmer as one unity that I call earth democracy but is the non-separation for cultivating life and regenerating life. So the, because the assault is not just severe on farming itself with artificial food, look at two years of COVID and lockdown. And here natural immunity, you know, the link between our food and our immunity established scientifically. We want to say, no, 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 no. There's not. Yes. Yes, yes. You work so with peasants. They give you lectures on immunity and say nobody in our village fell in. Nobody in our village fell in because we ate organic and we grew lots of herbs in our garden. So that is the moment between COVID and climate change and fake food. This connection. Yeah, that's the connection. Yeah, that's the connection. No, they're absolutely right. Absolutely right. But the thing is that now, there are very few people on the farms. In, in Britain, maybe two, three percent of people. And even those two, three or four percent of people who are on the land are not actually working on the land. They are mainly managing uh, the machinery and uh, the, uh, the technology uh, and so on. So um, uh, through your Earth University and Schumacher College, these are small examples, but is there any way we can expand this kind of understanding and skill base so that many, many more people 
start to work on the land and come back to the land so that we are not left just two, three percent of people producing so much food. Yeah, Satish, over these decades of, uh, of the Earth University, I get letters from people all over the world who said, you know, I was here so-and-so at Beat with Beat We Just like um, Schumacher does the six months and the one year, <clears throat> we do a one month of of return to the earth, the A to Z of living seed, living soil, living food and living economies, because it all goes together. Yeah. So we've had the brushing out, you know, the flushing out of people from the land. And it's been very consciously done ever since the enclosures of the commons, ever since colonialism. Again and again, freedom has meant we come back to the land. You know, the British created Samidari, peasants were removed. After independence, we created laws of land distribution. Small farmers came back to the land as cultivators. I think the place where we need true innovation, and I remember before the Earth's, uh, before the Paris summit on climate, the organic farmers had called me to launch a greater Paris food system. And it's very beautiful, their system. They're saying, we are not farmers. We don't, we don't have land but we want to farm to grow good food. Exactly as you said, Satish, the highest vocation is taking care of the earth and growing for food. These are young people, you know, who've left finance and IT, they want to farm. They don't have the money. They know in the city, there's all the money. So what we were launching there was asking the people in the cities to put their money into buying land, which maybe 20 young people can farm together. Yes. And that food then comes to those people who have put the money. So yes. instead of a billion dollars, what you take is many, 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 $10,000 and $50,000. So you change the pattern of big farms with big money and big investors wanting to extract more and more from the earth into tiny bits of money. I, I know bakeries. I know bakeries who, who were created by those who wanted good bread. And then the bakeries backwards went to farmers and said, let's grow real wheat. So allergies, you know, wheat allergies are because of industrial wheat and industrial bakeries. You get rid of it, our dear friend, Salvatore Ciccarelli, who teaches at the Earth University till the lockdown was not there. He has shown in country after country, Iran and all over the world, the minute you shift to ancient wheats, and baking by hand, and you love baking bread. That is what you teach the whole world, Satish. Yeah. No, bake bread, have a garden, everything is fine. Yeah, and I think we, you know, I think we have to reverse so many myths about food. We've been really, you know, we know there's fake news. We know with GMOs and chemicals, we got fake science. But this fake food means we are being stolen. Our health is being stolen. Our cells are being stolen. Our blood is being stolen, our future is being stolen. And that's why we must organize around creating systems that today might not look viable because the system has been so divided, yeah. separated, the far, few farmers, people wanting, and worst is the fact that they've made it look like the best farming is expensive. Nature didn't make it expensive. The lowest cost farming is farming with nature. If you give all the subsidies to industrial agriculture, you give all the subsidies to industrial food, and now you will give all the subsidies to fake food, of course that will become cheap. Yeah. That's why we need to, you know, those subsidies are our tax money. Sadly, you know, England is out of Europe and, you know, but the fight against the cap, which distorts, I think 2% people get most of the money and, that, that's our money, that's our tax money. So I think the question of subsidies has to come into the whole true price. But the best is I always say, you know, when you get cholesterol and your blockage and your heart is going, what do you do? You do a bypass. What we need is a bypass of the corporate corrupt subsidized toxic big food system. Mm -hmm. And people need to connect directly. Mm -hmm. And that means we have to use little bits of our money to support little funds. And this will become more important. You know, they're going to get rid of currency by, by the end of the decade. They're going to have cryptocurrencies. They'll have social credits where you'll be measured according to what you're worth. 
just read Microsoft's pageant that I wrote about in, uh, in March last year. So they are looking at a world without people, without farmers, without food, and currency will become, we will tell you whether you're worthy of living or you will die. They're talking that language in COVID now. We will decide who will live and die. They're talking about care homes and saying, it's not worth keeping old people alive. What kind of ethics have we arrived at to decide that the old people who built the today can be gotten rid of? So I think it's a real moment of caring coming to the center, love coming to the center, spirituality coming to the center. And the little initiatives we built are really like little, little lamps and candles to yeah. say it is not all dark, yeah. it works. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's a wonderful, uh, Bandana. I, it is so inspiring to hear you. And I'm sure the listeners are uh, also inspired and they also want to ask some questions. So I would like to open the discussion uh, for the audience to ask. And Ruchi, have you got some questions from the audience? Yes, yes, we do. And I think quite a few. Very inspiring, uh, inspiring moments from Vandana coming all these profound. And in the end, Vandana speaking about his spirituality and love and care and humanity and our understanding. These spiritual values are as important in agriculture as, uh, as the uh, material and, and the objective values. So thank you, Vandana, for all those words. Thank you, yeah. Satish. It's always such a joy to be with you, uh, even you. remote. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. So, Ruchi, please ask any questions uh, that people might have. Sure, sure, sure. I think a lot of these were, were already answered uh, uh, during the discussion. So I'm going to collect a few together and, and then we can take. But, you know, I think one of the um, uh, 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 points that I wanted to bring in, Satish, is... Uh, which also answers some of the question is, I remember when you spoke at the Vatican in October, you said that in the Jain tradition, your highest principle is nonviolence. And something uh, Dr. Shiva also talked about how this is the core uh, principle behind uh, the work um, that you both do. And, and that you said you would like that an oath of doing no harm be taken by everyone. And, and, and I think it's, it's, uh, it's a good moment to, to look at how these principles should be applied to our relationship with food and because yes. I see right so yeah, I, I, can, I can take one moment to to, rem to remind you uh, it was a great privilege and honor to be invited by the Vatican and speak in the presence of the Pope and and he I was asked to speak what are what what is the answer to our climate change and and the ecological crisis that we face today from a Jain point of view so my brief answer was that like doctors, when they graduate and become doctors, before becoming doctors, they take Hippocratic Oath, which means first do no harm. That is an oath of nonviolence. We are free to do whatever we wish to do, to serve the planet, to look after ourselves, to look after our family, to look after humanity, to look after everybody, as long as we do not harm. So first, do no harm. That is the Hippocratic Oath, which is a non-violence. If we do no harm to nature, no harm to animals, no harm to land, no harm to forest, no harm to people, no harm to ourselves, then we are free to do whatever else we want to do. So that was... Um, and then Pope Francis came to me and he was very kind and very humble. And he said, what you said is very good. And I hope um, the people can take this Hippocratic oath, even the scientists and even the econ economists and even the politicians and even the business leaders, they should all take Hippocratic oath. That's what Pope Francis said. It was a very nice uh, occasion and I was delighted. And, and so, Vanna, would you like to say something about nonviolence as well? Food systems that do not yeah. have. <laughs> I'd, I'd like to uh, to bring it back to the theme of the evening, you know, this issue of, uh, oh, we've got to be nice to the animals by getting rid of them. You know, that's not nonviolence. No, no. Doing no harm to the animal is nonviolence. Yeah. But if the animal, you know, if, like, well, I have a lovely friend. Oh, you, I didn't, yes, you met her. Did you come, Satish, when we did the Rajasthan thing and we went to the camel farm? Yes, yes, 
I went with you, yes. yes. And I drank, milk, the milk, I drank the camels. milk of the camels. So she, you know, the camel herds. Yeah. The, they are family. Everyone has a name. Everyone's like, you're, you're, they're your children. The cows, I mean, just yesterday I bought a very beautiful painting of the cow, the calf, the mother, the Krishna, you know. For us, it's all one continuum of nonviolence and love. Yeah. But because factory farms torture cows, you use that to then to tell, to tell two lies. Lie one is all cows are treated that way. No, different culture, the Maasai. The Maasai in Africa have such a loving relationship with animals. And so that's the first lie. The second lie is, oh, because the cows have four stomachs, they emit methane. No, you force them with the wrong diet they will emit methane. If I eat too much chana, I'm going to have gas. The digestive system for the cows is made for grasses and herbs. That's why they're called herbivores. So they take the absolutism of a factory farm and say all cows are torturing, being tortured. Then they take, oh, all cows are emitting methane. No, that's the wrong feed. They shouldn't be eating. Just like in England, you took dead cows, infected cows, and fed them to cows till they got the bovine spongiform disease and became mad cows. You give the wrong diet to children, they'll be sick. You give the wrong diet to cows, they will emit methane, they'll go mad. That's why food as a sacred container across life yeah. is to me to meet expression of ahimsa, because we can't live without eating, but eating without doing harm, being totally aware that in a food system, animals will graze plants, insects will come, and the food web is not violent. The web of life is not violent, it's based on ahimsa. Yeah. Eating is not violent. No, no. But doing harm by A, consciously treating badly, yeah. and two, trying to get rid, yeah? of the entity, you, I mean, in India, they sadly passed a law. Like I fought against laws that would make it illegal for farmers to save and exchange seed. That's what Navdanya's foundation is. It's our duty to save seed. Animals, they passed a law for that, you know, exchange of animals. We have the Pushkar Fair and all these beautiful fairs of animals where if animals are explained, they made it illegal. Now animals are roaming and suddenly Cows are being called stray cattle in this land of the sacred cow. Mm. So to me, that is violence. That is violence. And we have to, and yeah, nonviolence is a relationship. Yeah. It's not an object. No, it's no. a relationship. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Ruchi, next question. Yes. Um, uh, we have a question from Kali. As a student of agroecology, I struggle with the concept of scaling out. How do we address this paradigm within the agroecology community? of scaling out agroecological efforts versus localizing efforts, how can there be a balance between large scale and community driven action? <laughs> <laughs> Should I respond, Sati? Yes, Vandana, yes. So Kelly, you mixed up five or six concepts. Yeah? <clears throat> if I grow a seed and that seed happens to be a millet, it'll give me a million seeds. The seed, has stayed small, but it has multiplied. That is nonviolent multiplication. Yeah. But there's a scaling up, which is making things bigger and bigger and bigger. And Satish, with holding the legacy of Schumacher, you know, the beautiful book, Small is Beautiful, which he learned from India, Buddhist economics, <laughs> that small is the only place where you can practice nonviolence. But that doesn't mean it can't multiply. So multiplying is scaling out without error. The vertical concentration is scaling up. Multiplying by good example, good inspiration, good solidarity is scaling out. And Gandhi has a very beautiful st statement, which has been my inspiration for decades. He says, I don't want to be a world to be a pyramid where the top crushes the bottom that supports it. I see the world as an ever-expanding oceanic circle 
where every small circle is its own center and every larger circle is giving strength to all with it. So an ever expanding oceanic circle through love and ahimsa, that is without force. It happens when the right things are done. Very good, very good. I, I think that is good because it's a decentralized, the earth is big, but it's a decentralized. We don't have a centralized president of the earth or, or, or prime minister <laughs> of the earth or the parliament of the earth or anything like that. So decentralized, localized economies. And, and we have, a, we have a 8 billion people, but each one of us have our own intelligence which each one of us have our own uh, thinking, mind, heart, feeling, relationships. So you can have a large scale more on a kind of horizontal way rather than a vertical way. And that I think Vandana's answer, I totally agree. Let's have a next question. Yes, let me combine two questions, even though I think in a sense they have been answered, but um, Elizabeth says, how can we ensure that food systems prioritize high quality nutrient dense food. Um, and from Sarah, how do we make food growing truly inclusive in a world that is so disconnected from the earth, which is a theme of uh, this discussion, <laughs> connecting with, with the earth. Um, uh, I, and, and we have um, uh, a question from Marilyn on rice production um, uh, that is estimated to be responsible for 12% of uh, total methane global emissions. Is there a solution to its unsustainability. I think Dr. Shiva uh, and, and Navdanya's experience with growing uh, rice uh, uh, is, is a great uh, answer. And in fact, Vijay has asked, where do we find these older varieties? Vijay, we're gonna leave contacts um, uh, in the chat as well as at the end of the session. Um, I don't know if there's something you want to pick up. Uh, yes, uh, in, yes, in yes, but then I can start. Yes, yes. Satish. You, you start, Vandana. Okay, so, you know, this, I talked about the false universalization. You don't take factory farms and factory cows and say the whole world, every animal is a factory cow. It's a wrong equivalence. In a similar way, chemically fertilized, intensely irrigated rice paddies emit methane because the water is stagnant. But in all traditional systems, you will have A, if, it's wetlands along the coast, which are rice lands. You have ducks and rice. They paddle, they aerate. There's no buildup of methane. 70% of the rice varieties we have saved in Navdanya are dry land varieties. They don't grow in stagnant irrigated water. So it's this false universalization. Take, you know, corporation and industry have a very convenient habit. Take the worst of what you did yesterday globalize it and destroy the alternative. And our work, I mean, yesterday I was addressing my dear friends who work in fisheries. You know, they brought aquaculture, making the sea come onto the land, sp spreading salinity, spreading all kinds of diseases in the fish, using 10 times more fish in the sea to feed the aquaculture shrimp, destroying the mangroves that protect us. So they take the bad, globalize it and say, this is the only way, therefore we must do fake food. So fake food now is an environment, oh, there's no resources left and there'll be no food and there'll be no land and there's climate change. Let us in increase what we made wrong, more intensive agriculture, more greenhouse gases, more chemical fertilizers. So first is we must understand the diversity of this planet as Satish so beautifully put. The earth is not centralized and the south is not uniform. Diversity and decentralization is the way the earth works. Diversity and decentralization is the way all cultures of the earth has worked. Let's not take the worst of factory farming, the worst of globalized greed, the worst of industrial agriculture and say this is how the world works. No, it's a minority, it's only giving 20% of the bad food. Let's look at where things okay. happen differently and educate ourselves about it. Yeah. We Our have work yeah, I think we need to stop look, listening to the propaganda and start looking with our eyes at the farm next door. We have to remember, Ruchi, that uh, uniformity is not unity. And what we are doing in this world today is increasing more and more uniformity. 
And what Vandana and I are talking about is that the unity, but unity also dances with diversity. So unity mm -hmm. and diversity dance together. But what world is creating this monoculture and, and a kind of uniformity where we don't we forget the local conditions. My mother was a farmer and we grew in Rajasthan and my mother grew what was locally possible. She grew millets, she grew melons, she grew sesame seeds, she grew things which were available there. And in other parts nearby there were rice, so we could exchange something with our millet and, and so on. So this exchanging idea, exchanging ideas, exchanging goods uh, among neighbors and, and enabling even districts is fine. But this centralized, uniformed a kind of uh, monoculture and what we are losing now as um, Navdanya has been campaigning for a long time, we are losing this diversity of seeds, diversity of food, and we are eating fewer and fewer and fewer items and factory fed and fake food. So remember this basic principle that uniformity is not unity. We need to embrace diversity and diversity dance together with unity. Let's have the next question. I think uh, I think what you've just said is um, uh, is is also linked to the answer to the question that Suleiman has asked. Um, but I'm just going to read out the question because it's an important. Um, how can we create more radical, holistic, um, dignity-giving, safe, liberated, interdependent, joyful, ecological, sustainable, post-capitalist, anti-ableist, anti-racist, accessible approaches to regenerative practice? Con conversations and solutions that centered disabled people, especially disabled black, indigenous and people of color. Um, uh, he's talked about all the core principles that, that must be looked at also when we look at food systems that do no harm, <laughs> as you've said. Um, uh, there's another question, um, once well, the again- The question is how we do all these things, is it? What is the question yes, in that? Yes, yes. How we do get there? Now, Vandana might have some answer, but my answer would be that start wherever you are. Start with yourself. A huge river begins like a small spring in somewhere in the hills. Like um, if you are in India, Ganges starts in the Himalayas in a small, small uh, trickle. And then many, many tributaries join in. And then, then it becomes a greater and greater and greater great river, like Ganges or Thames or Hudson or whatever. So wherever you are, don't wait for somebody else to start. Begin with yourself, be the river, be the beginning of the river, be the spring, and then others will join you. This is how the great movements build. Um, so all the qualities you have suggested uh, of um, beautiful words you have used, all those qualities will come. We start with ourselves and then work together, communicate these ideas. All the great, um, great uh, reformers and revolutionaries have been great communicators. Mahatma Gandhi wrote 80 volumes of, of, of the book, collected works of Mahatma Gandhi. Martin Luther King was a great communicator. His speech of, I have a dream. Vandana is a great communicator. So learn to communicate your ideas to other people, through books, through poetry, through music, through action, through whatever way you can communicate. So that's all you can do. Start with yourself, communicate your ideas, other people will join you and it will become in the end, a big, great river of the movement. That is how I would suggest. But Vandana, yes. you can add to it. No, I just add, Gandhi said, yeah, the system is cruel and brutal and violent. Yeah. But you have to be the change you want to see because that's how change comes. Not yeah. by looking at a bad system and saying, oh, it's bad, it's bad, it's bad, it's bad, because yeah. we'll get exhausted yeah. and breathless yeah. finding all the problems. We got to know them, but the action has to be being the change we want to see. And so when you say, how do you create it? You're doing it anyway by doing it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then communicate that change. Yeah. Communicate with other yeah. people. Yeah. So that it spreads the idea like you are communicating and we are communicating this great uh, conference oxford real farmers conference a forum to communicate these ideas so more and more people come to learn about it and then then it will spread so let's continue on this great journey of transformation next question 
back to the theme on um, on on fake food and 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 the whole plant versus animal dichotomy that has been created. But um, this is a question from Stephanie: London alone consumes two hundred million beef burgers a day. I imagine the majority of which are from factory farms. So my question is how do we change the farming system if people want to continue consuming at that level how do we encourage change and change to what <clears throat> i think this is connected with the last question you know you're seeing a lot of people eating beef burgers our work is to make sure people realize how much diversity there is we've had so many people come to navania yeah. i remember the tibetans were sent by sam dong rinpoche who used to teach the gandhi course with satish and me yeah. And Sam Dong had chosen to be a vegetarian, yeah. but most of the Tibetans eat a lot of meat, you know, up in those mountains, they have, they eat a lot of meat. Yeah. And so they came and they had to spend a month with us learning organic farming. And this, they said, we can't, we can't think, we can't work. There's no meat here. So we said, you can go out and eat meat, but our campus is vegetarian. So uh, we don't cook meat. By the second day, they said, we don't miss it anymore. Then they realized, because it was in the mind, you know, I have to eat meat. Minute they ate all the diversity of food, they got all the nutrients. That emptiness disappeared. And they were fine for one month. So number one is there's been this brainwashing, you know, on the one hand, that meat is important. That's what was done all these years. But now the opposite is being done. And we are being made to confuse vegetarianism. We've had vegetarianism forever. And, you know, when you used to get onto flights or trains in Dehradun, the first thing they ask you is, veg or non-veg? Yeah? Do you want vegetarian or non-vegetarian? And now it's gone so confused. Nobody knows anymore. I would just plead with those who don't want to eat animal products, I say, go ahead and don't. There are enough vegetables in the world. But do not become subscribers to Mr. Bill Gates' empire of fake food. Please do not serve a bigger evil just because you want to avoid animal products. It's very easy to avoid animal products and eat lots of vegetables. And that's how people give up meat. They give up meat because they wake up to, you know, all those phytochemicals in plants. And the more the organic more phytochemicals. There's a lovely book by Eric Serenini, and I've written the foreword to it. He's the scientist who did the work on glyphosate and cancer. They've actually done work. That the fresher the food, the healthier your gut ecosystem. The organic food has far more interaction between your gut microbiome and the phytochemicals. Eating is a conversation. Food is not dead, food is living. And it's this larger consciousness that we are talking about. And I keep saying, let's get out of this trap of products, of things, you know? Forget that. Look at process and the reverence to the process. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, Ruchi, once I was invited at a school uh, in Dartington, in, in Devon, and children asked me, what is your favorite animal? And I said, an elephant. And the child asked me why. I said, elephant is so big, so powerful, so strong, and yet it never eats meat. It's vegetarian. <laughs> so as Bandana says, a lot of propaganda has been sort of given to us, brainwashing, that you need, everybody needs meat, no more protein. You know, a baby, when baby is born, what does baby drink? Mother's milk. Mother's milk is the minimal protein, about four or five percent of protein. And yet, within six months a year, baby gets double, triple body. How does that happen? So, this idea that uh, we have to eat a lot of meat, and of course, if you are living in Tibet or in some snowy country, and if you have organic, free range, uh, free ranging animals, and you eat meat, you hunt or, or, or free range. Uh, organic meat, understandable, small amount, but but um, I think there's a lot of propaganda, and propaganda is because they want to sell the meat. It's a business, and and you know, to make money, they want to sell the meat, and therefore it's a propaganda. So I think we need to be aware of that. Okay, next question. 
Um, we've, we've touched a little bit on this, but I think uh, just a, a question on what we can learn from the success of the farmers in India who protested and appear to have prevented market forces from taking over their farming system. Question. <laughs> uh, I think the first thing we must learn from the farmers' protest in India is resilience. Yes. They never gave up. And patience, yeah? They didn't want a reply tomorrow. They said, well, they want to keep us waiting here for five years, we'll sit here five years. But they'll have to give up these laws. And so it was the patience and resilience against a corporate driven set of laws. The second thing is diversity, the principle we've referred to again and again. Even though the propaganda kept saying, oh, it's the rich farmers of Punjab, but they were farmers, tribal farmers, they were landless women. I addressed a women farmers conference in Chandigarh. They were landless women saying, we are farmers too, because it's our body that does farming, not the ownership of land, yeah? They were shifting the definition of farming to what the human body does. Dalit women, they had transcended caste because these are the divides the establishment has created and it reinforces to keep us divided. Divide and rule has always been the principle of empire. They created unity in diversity, the beautiful phrase that these use, the dancing of diversity and unity. Yeah, so much talk of splits, the women were sitting there and not once was there violence against a single woman. They were living in tents under sheets. Everyone was looked after. And then they never ever only looked at what they didn't have. They looked at what they had and they supported themselves. Now, years ago, I got involved with the Chipko movement in the 70s. And the power of Chipko, which was the movement that came out and hugged trees in the Himalaya, started my journey on ecological activism, was every woman would bring a fistful of grain every day. And for months, they could sustain themselves. They came, the farmers came with trolleys, and they said, if they keep us here for six months, they keep us here for one year, we have enough food that we will feed each other. So self-reliance. And where does self-reliance begin? With food, what's our most basic need? Food. And that's the reason at this Oxford Real Farming Conference, I think if it can go away with the recognition first that food is the currency of life, not cryptocurrency, not the dollar, not the fading pound, food is the currency of life. It is what flows through life. Number two, food is the most basic need. And that's the reason those who have made money creating all kinds of controlled surveillance now want to make our food the ultimate instrument of control. Kissinger has said, food is the ultimate weapon. And we must avoid that. The third very important part of self-reliance is even though food was taken away from us, farmers were removed. Nature does not go away with her pension to stop providing us food if we work with her. And so we mustn't look all the time as what is not there. Terra nullius, empty earth. Bio nullius, empty sea. Mente nullius, empty mind. No, the earth is full. We are full of intelligence. We can be full of solidarity. And what the farmer's movement taught us is that solidarity doesn't have to come ready-made. They were not organized in all those amazing diversity. They cultivated the solidarity by respecting each other. And that's why we must now cultivate a new food solidarity and say all of us working with the diversity of the earth have far more power than what? Four tech giants, four poison cartel, two e-commerce giants, you know, Amazon, and three junk food creators. And then the few meat packers. Interestingly, please understand the same Tysons who created the factory farms are the ones who are financing and investing in fake meat. So don't see these as alternatives. They are both sources of money making. And look at where the money is going 
to take food away from us and we must reclaim it. And the farmers movement taught us that 14 months, about 100,000 farmers, women and men could sit together and cook food for themselves. Let's treat that as something we will do. It doesn't matter where the world takes us. We will ensure that as community, not in only one place, find the farmers, grow the garden so that we become food self-reliant. That's the first that's, self-reliance. That's a wonderful, I think that's a wonderful uh, statement to end this discussion. Uh, Vandana, you have given tremendous passion, patience, courage, inspiration, <laughs> ideas, thoughts. Wonderful, wonderful uh, to hear all these words from you. Thank you very much for what you are doing in Navdanya and at Vija and Earth University and around the world through your books, through your talking, through your being, through your presence, through your love, through your friendship. We are all blessed to have you with us um, and lead us uh, in this uh, food movement, organic and wholesome and a proper true food movement. We are blessed to have you with us. Thank you very much for all what you have given us. And now I would well, like- Well, we are blessed, Satish, to have you, Satish, and to have you as our guide. And I would say to all of those who are participating, look out for October. I think by September, we will put out a fortnight of action, which we begin always on Gandhi's birth anniversary for nonviolence, Ahimsa, and Satyagraha all the way to the 16th of October World Food Day. And those two weeks, we celebrate our food system, the food system we must grow and the food system we must resist through Satyagraha. So we will continue to work together. It was a joy being with you again, Satish, always is. Thank you. And thank you, thank thank you, you. Ruchi. And thank you to all, including the Oxford Real Farming Conference yes. and, and everyone and, who's and, participating. And congratulations to Oxford Real Farmers Conference for continuing to hold these big events every year after, uh, over so many years and in the future. We wish you every success. And with this, I would like to invite Ruchi to show a few contact uh, things and a few slides about Navdanya and anything that you want to show. To continue sure, I will, I, there have been uh, uh, quite a few questions asking us when the next courses will be. So I'm just going to put on the contacts on the screen. And at the same time, um, thank you, Satish Ji and Dr. Shiva for this wonderful opening for the Oxford Food and Co Farming Conference. And thank you to the team. Um, I'm going to leave uh, contacts in the chat as well as um on the slide a second here we are here are the contacts for, for those who would like to know about the courses coming up at the earth university um as well as uh, the websites for naftani and Naftani international as well as the schumacher college uh, um, and the resurgence and ecologist website and uh some of the courses that are coming up um as well, the A to Z of agroecology and biodiversity that Dr. Shiva just mentioned, as well as Gandhi and globalization and earth democracy that both Dr. Shiva and, and, and Satish Ji will be taking on. Um, in any case, on the links of the website, we will put all detailed links of the courses, both at Schumacher as well as um, uh, the Earth University. Um, so uh, here, and here are some of the articles um, as well as interviews. We'll be posting links to all of these. Um, uh, my colleagues are posting them in the chat. So, and some of the reports that we have worked on, on fake food, um, as well as the false solutions to some of the crises. Um, so please stay in touch with us. And uh, thank you, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Shiva. And thank you very much, Satish Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for attending and sending your questions. Thank you all.